So why don't you squat? <clears throat> I said, of course, legally you're entitled to um, make grants for, the, for this purpose, but I don't think you're entitled to withhold that information from the people of the country to whom you're indebted for your tax exemption. So why don't you tell the people of the country well, that's what you've told me? And his answer was, we would not think of doing any such thing. So then I said, well, Mr. Gaither, obviously, you forced the Congress to spend this money in order to find out what you've just told me. Technically, he is allowed, and foundations are allowed, to make grants for whatever they want. But if you are trying to subvert American interest and be tax exempt in those methods, then we should tax you because you don't have America's best interest involved in what you're doing. Technically, people can, people can lobby for whatever you want, but don't expect the American people to back you and be like, okay, it's all right for you to be tax exempt because you have America's best interest at heart and that's good for us. So we won't allow taxes to come into what you're doing if you're really trying to make America be more fruitful in the ways of the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution. We're like, hey, that's fine if you have America's best interest at heart. But if you don't, we're going to tax your money. You can do what you want. But don't expect to move around for free without us trying to get some of that money so we can fight against you, if anything. Mr. Dodd, you have spoken before about uh, some interesting things that were discovered by Catherine Casey at the Carnegie Endowment. Can you tell us that story, please? Yes, I'm glad to, Mr. Griffin. Um, this experience that you have just referred to came about in response to a letter which I had written to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace asking certain questions and gathering certain information and on the, on the arrival of that letter, Dr. Johnson, who was then president of the Carnegie Endowment, telephoned me and said, did I ever come up to New York? And I said, yes, I did, more or less each weekend. And he said, well, when you're next here, will you drop in and see us? Which I did. And again, on arrival at the office of the endowment, I found myself in the presence of Dr. Joseph Johnson, the, the president, who was a successor to Alger Hiss, two vice presidents and their own counsel, a partner in the firm of Sullivan and Cromwell. And Dr. Johnson said, after, again, amenities, Mr. Dodd, we have your letter. We can answer all those questions, but it'd be a great deal of trouble. And we have a counter suggestion. And our counter suggestion is that if you can spare a member of your staff for two weeks and send that member up to New York, we will give to that member a room in the library and the minute books of this foundation since its inception. And we think that whatever you want to find out or the Congress wants to find out will be obvious from those minutes. Well, my first reaction was they lost their mind. I had a pretty good idea of what those minutes would contain, but I realized that Dr. Johnson had only been in office two years and uh, the other, the, the vice presidents were relatively young men and counsel seemed to be also a young man, and I guessed that probably they'd never read the minutes themselves. And so I said I had somebody, I would take it. I would accept their offer. The thing that caught my ear is that Mr. Dodd said he knew that many of the people involved in working at the foundation hadn't bothered to look at the minutes for themselves whether they be young or old. And that's because oftentimes people take the words of others to be the truth. And Mark Twain wrote about that. 
And there is a quote from Mark Twain, and it says, In religion and politics, people's beliefs and convictions are in almost every case gotten at second hand and without examination from authorities who have not themselves examined the questions at issue but have taken them at second hand from other non-examiners. Police are policemen for a reason. Lawyers are lawyers for a reason. A judge is a judge for a reason. And though all of these faculties work together, there isn't anything per se that would make it so a cop knows how a judge is going to rule or a cop knows how a lawyer thinks about things or a lawyer understands the perspective of a cop and it's because all of them are different and if you don't bother to recognize the nuances of how these things are different you can push them all together because a cop ultimately doesn't know the law and he doesn't know the penalty that you'll ultimately pay for breaking the law. And so that's why I brought up Mark Twain here because he made it clear that people often borrow from others in their understanding of politics, religion, and one's own belief. He said they come from authorities of people involved in those jobs or industries. But what happens if the people involved in those industries just don't know what the fuck they're talking about? Then how do you dispute an issue? I'm going to read it again. In religion and politics, people's beliefs and convictions are in almost every case gotten at second hand. That means from someone else. Their beliefs come from someone else. Then he says, and without examination. So your opinions and your beliefs about things come from others and you didn't bother to examine what they told you. And then he says, from authorities who have not themselves examined the question at issue, but have taken them at second hand from other non-examiners. Everybody is just watching and listening. Nobody's doing their homework. Whose opinions about them were not worth a brass farthing. So most of these people out here who give opinions, their opinion isn't worth anything because they haven't bothered to examine the matter. And that's why when I try and explain things on my page or in my videos, I show definitions, I give opinions, I give quotes, historical references even so I can prove a point that it is what it is as long as we're defining things in the proper fashion a lot of people don't know shit because they've bothered to gain their opinion or their beliefs from others who haven't bothered to investigate the situation and when you when you yourself gain the ability to investigate and research matters on your own, chances are you'll come away with a totally different opinion from those who just try to tell you what it was without investigating the matter for them themselves. I forgot to add on one last thing. If you bother to attempt to challenge others and where their opinion comes from and how they came to the conclusion that they did, be sure to ask them 
where did you get that information from? And chances are, they'll tell you, everybody knows that. And I'd be willing to disagree. Most of the times when someone tells me everybody knows something, the bigger the crowd, the dumber the crowd. Um, I'm not interested in mass opinion at all, especially the majority opinion. Like I said, the bigger the crowd, the dumber the crowd. But, um, you know, be sure to ask people, how do you know that? What made you come to that conclusion? And see how analytical people become when you ask them where they get that information from. Let's take a look at analytical. An analytical, relating to or using analysis or logical reasoning. You know, in a similar words, systematic, logical, scientific, inquisitive. Investigate, inquiry. You know, we should want to use data in our analytical reasoning because the data is what makes things what they are. You know, if we're, we're gonna claim something, we should analyze the data to make sure it is what we say it is. And, you know, sometimes out here too, people tell you, trust the science. And or maybe they'll say to you, well, perhaps you're not qualified to analyze the data that we brought to you, but there are plenty of other people in the scientific world that are qualified to um, be systematic or scientific about data. Just go find them. Go look at peak prosperity. Once again, peak prosperity. And uh, check out my man Chris Mortensen on his uh, systematic, logical, scientific, investigative reporting. He does a great job on things. Go check them out. Peak Prosperity, Chris Mortensen. And I went back to Washington and I selected the member of my staff who was on my staff, having been a, a practicing attorney in Washington, but she was on my staff to pre see to it that I didn't break any congressional procedures or rules. In addition to which, she was unsympathetic to the purpose of the investigation. Uh, she was a um, level-headed and a very reasonably brilliant, capable lady. And her attitude of, toward the investigation was, what could possibly be wrong with foundations? They do so much good. Well, in the face of that sincere conviction of Catherine's, I went out of my way not to prejudice her in any way. But I did explain to her that she couldn't possibly cover 50 years of handwritten minutes in two weeks. So she would have to do what we call spot reading. And I blocked out certain periods of time to concentrate on. And off she went to New York. She came back at the end of two weeks with the following in the way of on, on dictaphone belts. Catherine Casey isn't the only person who had access to minutes of an organization. Um, there is another man named Carol Quigley. Carol Quigley wrote Tragedy and Hope. And Carol Quigley is also one of Bill Clinton's favorite professors. And Carol Quigley had access to many, many documents of groups and agencies that wanted him to document the things that they've done, the methods of control that they've used, and the connections for organizations and societies and presidents and worldviews and everything else in that book called Tragedy and Hope. Um, you guys should go check that out. Look up Carol Quigley on YouTube as well. Uh, there are several interviews with Carol Quigley. 
on the internet. And I'll probably include, once again, more on him in the epilogue.